Chapter 45, Nutrition Nutrition. Nutrition is a basic component of health, essential for normal growth and development, tissue repair and maintenance, cellular metabolism, and organ function. Food security is critical for all members of a household. This means that all household members have access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Medical Nutrition Therapy, MNT, uses nutrition therapy and counseling to manage diseases. Case Study Mrs. Gonzalez is a 65-year-old Hispanic woman who comes to the emergency department with slurred speech, right facial droop, and weakness in her upper and lower right side extremities. She is admitted to the hospital with the diagnosis of acute stroke. She has a daughter and two teenage grandchildren who live in another town nearby. What issues could Mrs. Gonzalez encounter that might interfere with her nutritional needs during her recovery? The answer is, swallowing problems, called dysphagia, problems with arm hand movements, for example, using a knife and fork, problems with memory and thinking, for example, forgetting to eat, loss of appetite or not feeling hungry, and inadequate support system. Nutrients, the biochemical units of nutrition. Basal metabolic rate or BMR is energy needed at rest to maintain life sustaining activities for a specific amount of time. Resting energy expenditure or REE is the amount of energy needed to consume over 24 hour period for the body to maintain internal working activities while at rest. Nutrients provides the energy necessary for the normal function of numerous body processes. We meet energy needs through a variety of nutrients such as carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water, vitamins and minerals. When the kilocalorie, kcal, of the food we eat meets our energy requirements, our weight does not change. When the kilocalories ingested exceed our energy demands, we gain weight. If the kilocalories ingested fail to meet our energy requirements, we lose weight. Carbohydrates are complex and simple saccharides. They provide our main source of energy. Proteins are amino acids. They are necessary for nitrogen balance. Fats are categorized as saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated. They are calorie dense, meaning, they provide a large amount of calories in a small amount of food. Each gram of carbohydrate produces 4 kcal per gram and serves as the main source of fuel for the brain, skeletal muscles during exercise, erythrocyte and leukocyte production, and cell function of the renal medulla. Proteins provide a source of energy, 4 kcal per gram. Collagen, hormones, enzymes, immune cells deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA, are all made of protein. In addition, blood clotting, fluid regulation, and acid-base balance require proteins. Fats, or lipids, are the most calorie-dense nutrient, providing 9 kcal per gram. Fats are composed of triglycerides and fatty acids. Scientific Knowledge Base Nutrients Water All cell function depends on a fluid environment. Vitamins They are essential for metabolism, and categorized as water-soluble or fat-soluble. Minerals are catalysts for enzymatic reactions. 
they are inorganic elements. Water makes up 60 to 70 percent of total body weight. In a healthy individual, fluid intake from all sources equals fluid output through elimination, respiration, and sweating. Vitamins are chemicals that act as catalysts in biochemical reactions. Antioxidants are vitamins that neutralize substances called free radicals, which produce oxidative damage to body cells and tissues. Minerals are inorganic elements essential to the body as catalysts in biochemical reactions. They are classified as macro minerals when the daily requirement is 100 mg or more. Micro minerals or trace elements are classified as when less than 100 mg is needed daily. Digestion Digestion is the mechanical breakdown that results from chewing, churning, and mixing with fluid and chemical reactions in which food reduces to its simplest form. Each part of the gastrointestinal or GI system has an important digestive or absorptive function. Digestion begins in the mouth, where chewing mechanically breaks down food. The food mixes with saliva which contains tylen or salivary amylase, an enzyme that acts on cooked starch to begin its conversion to maltose. Swallowed food enters the esophagus, and wave-like muscular contractions, or peristalsis, move the food to the base of the esophagus, above the cardiac sphincter. Pressure from a bolus of food at the cardiac sphincter causes it to relax, allowing the food to enter the fundus, or uppermost portion. Of the stomach. The stomach acts as a reservoir where food remains for approximately three hours, with a range of one to seven hours. Food leaves the antrum, or distal stomach, through the pyloric sphincter and enters the duodenum. Food is now an acidic, liquefied mass called chyme. Peristalsis continues in the small intestine. Mixing the secretions with chyme, the mixture becomes increasingly alkaline, inhibiting the action of the gastric enzymes and promoting the action of the duodenal secretions. The major portion of digestion occurs in the small intestine, producing glucose, fructose, and galactose from carbohydrates, amino acids and peptides from proteins, and fatty acids, glycerides, and glycerol from lipids. Peristalsis takes approximately 5 hours to pass food through the small intestine. Absorption The small intestine, lined with finger-like projections called villi, is the primary absorption site for nutrients. The body absorbs nutrients by means of passive diffusion, osmosis, active transport, and pinocytosis. The absorption of carbohydrates, protein, minerals, and water-soluble vitamins occurs in the small intestine. Approximately 85 to 90% of water is absorbed in the small intestine. The GI tract manages approximately 8.5 liters of gastrointestinal secretions and 1.5 liters of oral intake daily. The small intestine resorbs 9.5 liters, and the colon absorbs approximately 0.4 liters. Elimination of the remaining 0.1 liters occurs via feces. Electrolytes and minerals are absorbed via the colon. Bacteria synthesize vitamin K and some B-complex vitamins. Finally, feces form for elimination. Metabolism, and storage of nutrients. Metabolism, it encompasses all biochemical reactions within the cells of the body. This process is anabolic, building, or catabolic, breaking down. Anabolism is the building of more complex biochemical substances by synthesis of nutrients. Catabolism is the breakdown of biochemical substances into simpler substances. It occurs during physiological states of negative nitrogen balance. 
Starvation is an example of catabolism when wasting of body tissues occurs. Metabolism consists of three main processes, catabolism of glycogen into glucose, carbon dioxide, and water called glycogenolysis, anabolism of glucose into glycogen for storage called glycogenesis, and catabolism of amino acids and glycerol into glucose for energy gluconeogenesis. Elimination Chyme will continue to move by peristaltic action through the ileocecal valve into the large intestine, where it becomes feces. Water absorbs in the mucosa as feces move toward the rectum. The longer the material stays in the large intestine, the more water is absorbed, which causes the feces to become firmer. Dietary Guidelines the Dietary Reference Index provides the acceptable ranges of vitamins and minerals for each gender and age group. There are four components of the Dietary Reference Index, Estimated Average Requirement, Recommended Dietary Allowance, Adequate Intake, and Tolerable Upper Intake Level. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Created daily values for food labels in response to the 1990 Nutrition Labeling and Education Act. They are comprised of daily values needed for proteins, vitamins, fats, cholesterol, carbohydrates, fiber, sodium, and potassium. The daily values are based on percentages of a diet consisting of 2,000 kcal for adults and children 4 years or older. Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2010 provides average daily consumption guidelines for the five food groups, grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy products, and meats. Choose My Plate replaced the My Food Pyramid program. This program includes guidelines for balancing calories, decreasing portion size, increasing healthy foods, increasing water consumption, and decreasing fats sodium, and sugars. Nurses should consider the food preference of patients of different racial and ethnic groups, vegetarians, and others when planning diets. Mrs. Gonzalez is awake and alert in her hospital room, yet is drooling from the right side of her mouth. When she tries to drink water, she starts to cough. The physician has ordered nothing by mouth. Evaluation by the speech-language pathologist indicates inadequate clearance of food and liquid from the vocal folds and aspiration of thickened liquids. Mrs. Gonzalez has trouble swallowing with oropharyngeal dysphagia. The speech-language pathologist recommends enteral feedings and speech and swallowing therapy to help her return to oral feedings. Were you able to predict that Mrs. Gonzalez would receive enteral feedings? Enteral feeding refers to the delivery of a nutritionally complete feed, containing protein, carbohydrate, fat, water, minerals and vitamins, directly into the stomach, duodenum or jejunum. Quick Quiz A 22-year-old new mother is breastfeeding. You ask her if she is taking the correct quantities of nutrients, which statement reflects that she understands the dietary guidelines. A. I am not concerned with what I am eating. B. I am taking vitamin doses based on TV. C. I am taking a daily MVI. Or, D. I am making eating choices according to the recommended dietary allowances. The answer is, D, I am making eating choices according to the recommended dietary allowances. Nursing Knowledge Base There are several factors that influence nutrition. Environmental, cultural, psychological, emotional, and developmental needs. In regards to developmental needs, 
Infants through school age children experience rapid growth and require high protein meals. School age children should be assessed for adequate protein and vitamin D and C intake. Adolescents have increased energy needs owing to higher metabolic growth demands. Young and middle adult requirements focus on energy for maintenance and repair as growth slows. The older adult experiences a decreased need for energy due to slowing of their metabolic rate. The following are supplements to the PowerPoint and should be reviewed in the textbook. Box 45-3, Potential Assessment for Eating Disorders. Box 45-4, Focus on Older Adults, Factors Affecting Nutritional Status. And Table 45-2, Sample of Drug-Nutrient Interactions. Case Study Continued Matt is a nursing student assigned to Mrs. Gonzalez. As he prepares to assess her, he recalls information about the effects of dysphagia on nutrition and rehabilitation. He will assess Mrs. Gonzalez's weight, weight history, diet history, and cultural customs. Matt knows to consult with a registered dietitian to assess Mrs. Gonzalez's nutritional status and interventions. Matt is responsible for inserting Mrs. Gonzalez's small-bore nasogastric feeding tube and starting her tube feedings. The registered dietitian has recommended continuous tube feeding for 12 hours during the day. What are the effects of dysphagia on nutrition? The effects of dysphagia on nutrition include dehydration, malnutrition, weight loss, and anorexia. The continuous tube feeding places Mrs. Gonzalez at risk for aspiration pneumonia, depression, and a significant decrease in her quality of life. Alternative food plans. Patients quite often have alternative food plans that must be considered. These are typically based on religion, cultural background, ethics, health beliefs, and preferences. Vegetarian diet consists predominantly of plant foods, all active vegetarians avoid meat, fish, and poultry, but eats eggs and milk. The lacto-vegetarian drinks milk but avoids eggs. Vegans consumes only plant foods. Zen macrobiotic consists primarily of brown rice, other grains, and herb teas. Fruitarians consume fruit, nuts, honey, and olive oil. Critical thinking. Successful critical thinking requires a synthesis of knowledge, experience, information gathered from patients, critical thinking attitudes, and intellectual and professional standards. Professional standards resources include Dietary Reference Intake, USDA MyBlood Dietary Guidelines, Healthy People 2020, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association. American Cancer Society, American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. Assessment. Patient-centered clinical decisions require safe nursing care. When assessing a patient's nutritional history, the nurse should ask the patient about food preferences, values regarding nutrition, and expectations from nutritional therapy. Patients should be screened to identify malnutrition, or risk for malnutrition. Several standardized nutritional screening tools are available for use in the outpatient and inpatient settings. Serial measures of weight over time provide more useful information than a single measurement. The patient should be weighed at the same time every day, on the same scale and with the same clothing or linen. Anthropometry is a measurement system of the size and makeup of the body. An ideal body weight provides an estimate of what a person should weigh. Body mass index measures weight corrected for height and serves as an alternative to traditional height-weight relationships.
laboratory and biochemical tests to assist with evaluating nutritional status include albumin, transferrin, prealbumin, retinol binding protein, total iron binding capacity, and hemoglobin. Factors that frequently alter test results include fluid balance, liver function, kidney function, and the presence of disease. Factors that affect serum albumin levels include hydration, hemorrhage, renal or hepatic disease, large amounts of drainage from wounds, drains, burns, or the GI tract, steroid administration, and exogenous albumin. The diet history focuses on a patient's habitual intake of foods and liquids and includes information about preferences, allergies, and other relevant topics such as the patient's ability to obtain food. A health history includes assessment of a patient's health status, age, cultural background, religious food patterns, socioeconomic status, personal food preferences, psychological factors, use of alcohol or illegal drugs, use of vitamin, mineral, or herbal supplements, prescription or over-the-counter, OTC, drugs, and the patient's general nutrition knowledge. A general physical assessment of body systems should be performed and additional recheck of relevant areas to evaluate a patient's nutritional status. Physical examination should also include observing for malnutrition. Dysphagia refers to difficulty swallowing. The causes and complications of dysphagia vary. Warning signs of dysphagia include coughing while eating, change in voice tone or quality after swallowing, abnormal movements of the mouth, tongue, or lips, and slow, weak, imprecise, or uncoordinated speech. Review Skill 45 1 Aspiration Precautions as a supplement to this PowerPoint. Case study continued. Assessment findings. Mrs. Gonzalez starts to cough when she tries to drink water. Mrs. Gonzalez is unable to swallow and aspirates pills and thicken liquid. Her lung sounds are clear. Respirations are regular at a rate of 12 per minute. She has no dyspnea. Oxygen saturation is 96% on room air. The provider has ordered enteral nutrition to begin at 60 mlHr. What diagnosis would you expect? Answer. Mrs. Gonzalez is at risk for aspiration. She should be evaluated for swallowing ability, her respiratory status monitored, and an assessment of her nutritional status should be performed. Possible nursing diagnoses are shown on the slide. Nursing diagnoses may be related to actual nutrition problems, for example inadequate intake, or to problems that place the patient at risk for nutritional deficiencies such as oral trauma, severe burns, and infections. Case study continued. Mrs. Gonzalez has a nursing diagnosis. Risk for aspiration related to impaired swallowing. The goals are, Mrs. Gonzalez will receive adequate nutrients through enteral tube feeding without aspiration by the time of discharge. Mrs. Gonzalez will regain swallowing ability from speech therapy by the time of discharge. What are some expected outcomes for these goals? Expected outcomes include, Mrs. Gonzalez's weight at discharge will be within 2 pounds of admission weight. Mrs. Gonzalez will not exhibit signs of aspiration before discharge. Mrs. Gonzalez's albumin and prealbumin levels will remain normal before discharge. And, Mrs. Gonzalez will progress to an oral diet before discharge to a restorative care facility. Planning Goals and outcomes should reflect a patient's physiological, therapeutic, and individualized needs. Setting priorities are important, 
The priority of care of surgical patients is to provide optimal preoperative nutritional support in patients with malnutrition. The priority for the resumption of food intake after surgery depends on the return of bowel function planning also requires teamwork and collaboration. The patient and family must collaborate with the nurse in planning care and setting priorities. Communicate patient goals and planned interventions to all team members to achieve expected patient outcomes. Consulting with a speech-language pathologist, registered dietitian, pharmacist, and or occupational therapist about patients with an altered nutritional status is key. Nutrition can be provided either through a feeding tube, called enteral nutrition, or when the digestive tract cannot be used, through an intravenous tube called a catheter that is inserted directly into the veins, called parenteral nutrition. Implementation Administration of enteral tube feedings typically enters through the stomach or intestines via a tube inserted through the nose or percutaneous access. Patients who cannot tolerate nutrition through the GI tract receive parenteral nutrition, a solution consisting of glucose, amino acids, lipids, minerals, electrolytes, trace elements, and vitamins, through an indwelling peripheral or central venous catheter. Review Skill 45-2, Inserting a Small Bore Nasoenteric Tube for Enteral Feedings, and Skill 45-3, Administering Enteral Feedings via Nasoenteric, Gastrostomy, or Trajunostomy Tubes, for a supplement to this PowerPoint. When oral feeding assistance is inadequate in providing appropriate nutrition, Enteral or parental feeding is required. Enteral nutrition is the preferred method of meeting nutritional needs if the patient is unable to swallow or take in nutrients orally, yet has a functioning gastrointestinal tract. Tubes are inserted through the nose, called nasogastric or nasointestinal, surgically called gastrostomy or jejunostomy, or endoscopically called percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy or jejunostomy. Surgical or endoscopically placed tubes are preferred for long-term feeding. Before beginning a tube feeding, you will learn in the skills lab to flush the line with a small amount of water to ensure that the tube is clear and patent. Tube feedings typically are started at full strength, and at slow rates. Increase the hourly rate every 8 to 12 hours per healthcare provider's order, if no signs of intolerance appear. When patients are unable to ingest food but are still able to digest and absorb nutrients, the use of enteral tube feeding is supported. Feeding tubes are inserted through the nose, called nasogastric or nasointestinal, surgically, such as with a gastrostomy or jejunostomy, and endoscopically placed as with a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy or jejunostomy. Case study continued, nutritional management involves, inserting the feeding tube as ordered, initiating an enteral feeding as prescribed, and, advancing tube feeding as tolerated, monitor for tolerance, aspiration precautions are a priority, position Mrs. Gonzalez with head of bed elevated a minimum of 30 degrees, check tube placement every 4 to 6 hours, check gastric residual volume every 4 hours. N. Continue with speech therapy. What is the rationale for the tube feeding intervention? The answer is, the enteral tube feeding will allow for safe provision of nutrients while swallowing is rehabilitated with the assistance of the speech-language pathologist. Time for a quick quiz. You receive an order to begin enteral tube feedings. The first step is to A. Place the patient in a prone position. B. Irrigate the tube with normal saline. C. Check to see that the tube is properly placed. D. Introduce a small amount of fluid into the tube before feeding.
The answer is D. Why? To check for patency before starting feedings. Parental nutrition refers to when nutrients are provided intravenously. This intervention is appropriate when patients are unable to digest or absorb enteral nutrition or are in highly stressed physiological states, but the goal to move toward the use of the gastrointestinal tract is constant. For this type of specialized nutrition, a peripheral or central line required. Parental nutrition with greater than 10% dextrose requires a CVC that a healthcare provider places into a high flow central vein such as the superior vena cava under sterile conditions. Parental nutrition with less than 10% dextrose can be administered via a peripheral line. When initiating parenteral nutrition, label the port and do not infuse other solutions or medications through it. Preventing complications is a priority. Complications of parental nutrition include catheter-related problems and metabolic alterations. Health promotion involves educating patients and family caregivers about balanced nutrition and to assist them in obtaining resources to eat high-quality meals. Early identification of potential or actual problems is necessary. Meal planning takes into account the family's budget and different preferences of family members. Weight loss plans should consider the patient's preferences and resources and includes awareness of portion sizes and knowledge of the energy content of food. Patient education on food safety is intended to reduce risks for foodborne illness. The priorities in the acute care setting include identifying risk factors in the acutely ill patient. Health care providers order a gradual progression of dietary intake or therapeutic diet to manage patient's illness, promoting appetite, and assisting with oral feedings. Please review the following as a supplement to this PowerPoint. Table 45-6 Nutrition and the Immune System, Box 4510, Diet Progression and Therapeutic Diets. When inserting a nasogastric tube, follow these steps. Explain the procedure to the patient, discussing it fully and instructing the patient in ways in which he or she can assist to make the procedure go smoothly. If the NG tube is to be connected to suction, set up the suction apparatus, including a canister and connector tube that connects to the NG tube adapter. Measure the length of the NG tube by measuring from the tip of the patient's nose to the earlobe, and then to the xiphoid process. Mark this length on the tube with an indelible marker or a small piece of tape. But if using tape, do not wrap the tape so tightly around the tube that it is difficult to remove once the tube has been inserted. This determines the approximate length to insert the NG tube. Determine the patency of the patient's nares before selecting an acceptable nares. Wearing clean examination gloves, plug the end of the NG tube before inserting it to prevent outflow when you reach the stomach. Alternatively, snugly insert the tip of a piston-style irrigation syringe into the open end of the NG tube, with the plunger pulled back a few milliliters. You can then later check placement using this syringe. Lubricate 3 to 4 inches of the tip of the NG tube with a small amount of water-soluble lubricant. Avoid using petroleum-based lubricants, as they increase the risk of pneumonia due to inhaling petrolatum products. Repeat the instructions for the patient and ask if he or she has further questions. Have the patient hyperextend the neck. Insert the tube through the patient's nares, slowly advancing the tube downward into the nasopharynx. You may feel slight resistance as the tube enters the nasopharynx. Gentle rotation or changing the angle of the tube typically overcomes this. Never force the tube if there is more than the slightest resistance. Forcing the tube can result in serious damage to the nasal mucosa. If you meet resistance, remove the tube, re-lubricate the end of the tube, and attempt insertion in the opposite nares. It is typical for the patient's eyes to water during tube insertion. 
When the patient begins to gag, you know that the tube is in the posterior nasopharynx. Stop advancing the tube and withdraw it a very short distance, about one-eighth of an inch, and just enough to stop the gagging. Encourage the patient to take a couple of deep breaths and relax. Then instruct the patient to flex his or her head forward slightly. Drink a sip of water and swallow. Continue to cue the patient to swallow. Gently advance the tube each time the patient swallows. If the patient continues to gag and cough, use a pen light and tongue blade to make certain that the tube is not curled up in the back of the throat. If the patient exhibits symptoms of respiratory distress or cyanosis, stop the procedure and withdraw the tube immediately. Monitor the depth of tube insertion, noting when you reach the marked level. Observe for return of stomach contents into the tube. If the syringe is attached, you can easily aspirate the stomach contents for checking placement. Once the tube is in place, secure the end by taping it to the patient's nose. As you tape the tube, make certain to avoid positioning the tube where it is pressing against the nares. Check placement of the tube by aspirating gastric contents with the irrigation syringe. Note the color and check the pH of the fluid with litmus paper. The pH should be acidic between 1 and 4. Apply a tubing clamp or insert a plug. Until placement has been verified by X-ray, nothing can be instilled into the NG tube, including a normal saline flush, water, medications, and formula. Using an indelible marker, boldly mark the tube at the point of insertion and measure the length of tube extending from the body. Record this measurement. Secure the tube to the patient's gown using tape and a safety pin with enough slack to allow for head movement. Document the procedure, time it was performed, patient's tolerance of the procedure, length of tube extending from insertion site, method used to determine correct placement and findings, characteristics of any drainage, and patient's current respiratory status. When you finish the procedure, remember the universal steps that apply after all procedures. For example, leave the patient in a safe, comfortable position with the call device in easy reach. Restorative and continuing care. Restorative care includes both immediate post-surgical care and routine medical care and therefore includes patients in the hospital and at home. Optimal nutrition is important in health and illness. Medical nutrition therapy is the use of specific nutritional therapies to treat an illness, injury, or condition. Medical nutrition therapy is necessary to help the body metabolize certain nutrients correct nutritional deficiencies related to the disease, and eliminate foods that may exacerbate disease symptoms. It is most effective using a team approach that promotes collaboration between the healthcare team and an registered dietitian. Medical Nutrition Therapy Control peptic ulcers with regular meals and medications such as histamine receptor antagonists that block secretion of hydrochloric acid, or proton pump inhibitors. Helicobacter pylori has been identified as a bacterium that causes up to 85% of peptic ulcers. It is confirmed by laboratory tests or a biopsy during endoscopy. Antibiotics treat and control the bacterial infection. Stress and overproduction of gastric acid also irritate a pre-existing ulcer. Encourage patients to avoid foods that increase stomach acidity and pain such as caffeine, decaffeinated coffee, frequent milk intake, citric acid juices, and certain seasonings such as hot chili peppers, chili powder, and black pepper. Discourage smoking, alcohol, aspirin, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Teach patients to eat a well-balanced, healthy diet, avoid eating large meals, and eat three regular meals, or several small meals daily. Inflammatory bowel disease includes Cohn's disease and idiopathic ulcerative colitis. Treatment of acute inflammatory bowel disease includes elemental diets which are formula with the nutrients in their simplest form ready for absorption, or parental nutrition when symptoms such as diarrhea and weight loss are prevalent. 
The treatment of malabsorption syndromes such as celiac disease includes a gluten-free diet. Gluten is present in wheat, rye, barley, and oats. If the patient is diagnosed with short bowel syndrome, which results from extensive resection of bowel, they typically suffer from malabsorption caused by lack of intestinal surface area. These patients require lifetime feeding with either elemental enteral formulas or parental nutrition. Diverticulitis is a condition that results from an inflammation of diverticula, which are abnormal but common pouch-like herniations that occur in the bowel lining. Nutritional treatment for diverticulitis includes a moderate or low residue diet until the infection subsides. Afterward, prescribing a high-fiber diet for chronic diverticular problems ensues. Case study continued. Matt must keep in mind that Mrs. Gonzalez will progress to restorative care and return to oral feedings, and also must consider cultural preferences. Matt knows that food safety is an important issue. Matt also consults the dietitian, and together they develop a teaching plan regarding food safety for the foods that Mrs. Gonzalez's family will be preparing at home. What expected outcomes would Matt set for the food safety teaching session? The expected outcomes are as follows. At the end of the teaching session, Mrs. Gonzalez's family is able to state measures to reduce foodborne illnesses such as wash hands, preparation surfaces, and utensils, cook meat, poultry, fish, and eggs at 180 degrees, wash fresh fruits and vegetables, refrigerate foods at 40 degrees within two hours of cooking, discard spoiled foods. Use plastic laminate or solid surface cutting boards wash dish rags, towels, and sponges with bleach. Clean inside of refrigerator and microwave regularly with bleach or soap. Matt could also evaluate the family in preparing Mrs. Gonzalez as food and preventing foodborne illnesses by making a home visit. Medical Nutrition Continued Type 1 diabetes mellitus requires both insulin and dietary restrictions for optimal control, with treatment beginning at diagnosis. In contrast, type 2 diabetes mellitus initially start with exercise and diet therapy. If these measures prove ineffective, it is common to add oral medications. Plan of care for the patient with diabetes mellitus should include the following, an individualized diet. Carbohydrate consistency and monitoring. Saturated fat less than 7%. Cholesterol intake less than 200 mg daily. Protein intake 15% to 20% of diet. The goal of medical nutrition is to have glycemic levels that are normal or as close to normal as safely possible. Lipid and lipoprotein profiles that decrease the risk of microvascular complications such as renal and eye disease, cardiovascular, neurological, and peripheral vascular complications, and blood pressure in the normal or near normal range. Diet therapy for reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease includes balancing calorie intake with exercise to maintain a healthy body weight. The goal of the American Heart Association Dietary Guidelines is to reduce risk factors for the development of hypertension and coronary artery disease. American Heart Association Dietary Guidelines include the following, balance caloric intake and exercise. Maintain a healthy body weight. Eat a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and complex carbohydrates. Eat fish twice per week. Limit foods and beverages high in sugar and salt. Limit transaturated fat to less than 1%. Cancer and cancer treatment. Malignant cells compete with normal cells for nutrients. Most cancer treatments cause nutritional problems. Anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and taste distortions are common. 
Malnutrition associated with cancer increases morbidity and mortality. Radiation causes anorexia, stomatitis, severe diarrhea, intestinal strictures, and pain. Nutrition management focuses on maximizing intake of nutrients and fluids. Diet should be individualized to a patient's needs, symptoms, and situation. Patients with human immunodeficiency virus or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome typically experience body wasting and severe weight loss related to anorexia, stomatitis, oral thrush infection, nausea, or recurrent vomiting, all resulting in inadequate intake. Factors associated with weight loss and malnutrition include severe diarrhea, GI malabsorption, and altered metabolism of nutrients. Systemic infection results in hypermetabolism from cytokine elevation. The medications that treat HIV infection often cause side effects that alter the patient's nutritional status. Restorative care of malnutrition resulting from AIDS focuses on maximizing kilocalories and nutrients. Small, frequent, nutrient-dense meals that limit fatty and overly sweet foods are easier to tolerate. Diagnose and address each cause of nutritional depletion in the care plan. The progression of individually tailored nutrition support begins with administering oral, to enteral, and finally to parenteral. Case study continued. What nursing actions are appropriate for evaluating whether goals have been met? Consider the patient's perspective. Check measurable outcomes. Consult with interdisciplinary staff. Nursing actions taken to verify achievement of outcome include asking Mrs. Gonzalez if she is experiencing any gastrointestinal discomfort, weighing Mrs. Gonzalez weekly, monitoring her laboratory values, asking the speech language pathologist about Mrs. Gonzalez swallowing rehabilitation. Evaluation. Expectations and health care values held by nurses frequently differ from those held by patients. Successful interventions and outcomes require nurses to know what patients expect in addition to nursing knowledge and skill. Work closely with patients to define their expectations, and talk with them about their concerns if their expectations are not realistic. Consider the limits of their conditions and treatment their dietary preferences, and their cultural beliefs when evaluating outcomes. Changes in condition also indicate a need to change the nutritional plan of care. Consult multidisciplinary members of the health care team in an effort to better individualize this plan. The patient is an active participant whenever possible. In the end, a patient's ability to incorporate dietary changes into his or her lifestyle with the least amount of stress or disruption facilitates attainment of outcome measures. Failing to meet expected outcomes requires revising the nursing interventions or expected outcomes based on the patient's needs or preferences. Matt sees Mrs. Gonzalez before discharge to a restorative care facility for rehabilitation before returning home. Mrs. Gonzalez now is able to consume all of her required nutrients with a ground diet and nectar thickened liquids. Matt removes the feeding tube in preparation for her transport to the new facility. Matt advises Mrs. Gonzalez to continue the care plan and emphasizes that it is important to continue speech therapy. Matt also discusses the importance of compliance with diet modifications until swallowing function returns completely. What would Matt write in a documentation note? Matt would include the following in his documentation note. 1. Removal of feeding tube. 2. How patient tolerated the removal. 3. Any teaching and education provided to the patient and 4. Discussion of discharge instructions.